good morning or afternoon or whenever it is you're listening to this. This is COVID Catechism. I'm Father Ryan Humphreys representing the Catholic Underground. I'm the pastor at St. Edward Catholic Church in Tallulah, Louisiana. And today we start our first series on COVID Catechism, which is the Book of Revelation. Now that's no small task to get involved with the book of Revelation, and so we're not going to try to do this in one part. I'm going to do it in four total parts, and the breakdown is going to be, number one, today is all about trying to figure out what Bible study is. How do we do it? What are the moving pieces? Remember, COVID Catechism is not meant to be the basics. Uh, we have plenty of the basics out there. And so we're not going to do uh, the basics. We're going to do, what do you want to do when you actually say, I want to study the Bible. I want to get dig dug in. Not that I want a doctoral degree. Not that I want to know, the, you know what eisegesis is or be able to use big fancy words. But I want to really kind of have a sense of how I should read the Bible if I want to study the Bible. So that's today. The next time we do this, which will be when the next time you watch it, uh, we will have then the beginning of the book of Revelation. That's all those messages back and forth to the angels. We'll get in a little bit to some of the more kind of liturgical things. We'll get into a little deeper understanding of where St. John is coming from. And then the last talk, we'll get really neck deep into kind of the end of the world part of the book of Revelation. So four parts for you. Each of them will have kind of their own different feel. Um, they really aren't independent although you don't have to watch them in order, it would be really helpful to do so. Today, again, we're digging into what is Bible study on large? You know, what is it? How do we even get into that? And so I want to jump right in. I want to read a, 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 a passage from the book of Revelation. A couple of verses for you. This is chapter 9. We'll start with verse 7, Revelation 9, 7. In appearance, the locusts were like horses arrayed for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces, their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had the scales like iron breastplates, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They had tails like scorpions and stings, and their power of hurting men for five months lies in their tails." They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek he is called Apollyon. Well, any thoughts? I'm sure that's just very obvious to all of us. No problem. We can just interpret that right away, except that we really can't. I mean, all of us can give a fairly good explanation of what the Lord means in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, turn the other cheek. There's plenty of things that could be said theologically, and the great masters of the spiritual life will be able to understand it more than, than us people. But I mean, good Lord, locusts with women's hair and stingers, and they're, in, they're run by a guy with a name in Hebrew, which is Abaddon. Good Lord. There's no joke digging into what that means. And in fact, I'm not going to try to list through the hundreds of complex and confusing theological statements that have been made, ranging from the simple idea of, you know, what does a hornet symbolize and what does a scorpion symbolize back in the Hebrew culture, up to some folks who are talking about these things symbolizing CIA black helicopters. No joke. And so it's extremely difficult for us just to grab a verse of the Bible without the other context and just start to interpret it right away. And so at the end of the day, we have to kind of understand that none of us are really prepared to, to just dive in and to just pick up the scriptures and just start reading without any real sense of context. Additionally, we have to understand that for 20 centuries, the church has been working to understand what the Lord is saying in the scripture as well as through the lives of the saints, as well as through the lived experience of the church in all the different places in which she lives. And so what we need to try to understand before we ever open up our Bibles and just dive in is that we have to understand the, the real core of what we believe as Christians. And what the real core of what we believe as Christians is easy enough to find, and it's in the Bible. 
It's the first 14 chapters of St. John's Gospel. And I want to read that for you because it's only once we get this that we can open up any other chapter of the Bible and start to really draw something out of it. St. John's Gospel begins this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came for testimony, to bear witness to the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness with the light. And the true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world knew him not. He came to his own home, and his own people received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not by blood, nor by the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And if you follow me in the Latin Mass, we read those, four, those 14 chapters, for gospel, the 14 verses of John's Gospel at the end of every single Mass. Because they are the heartbeat of what we believe as Christians. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The revelation of the Word is not a text. It's not a dead, mute writing which is stuck in time and place and culture. It, it, we have to take a minute to realize how big of a deal that is. We're not talking about the Holy Spirit telling us how to interpret the Bible. That's not what Bible study is. That's not what we are meant to do, and it's certainly not what we're doing here. Judaism, Islam, these are religions that are called religion of the book. They have a sacred text, and their holy book is what they've got. That's the entirety of what God has given them. That's their revelation. And so if you were a believing Jew, you have no way, not for real, to argue for or against abortion. You have no way to argue for or against human cloning. You have no way to speak to the modern world because you're bound by this text, this dead, lifeless text written on paper that you have to read and study and understand. And, and that's why the vast majority of modern Jews basically just ignore the text and have interpreters kind of give it to them. Islam is in a different boat. They rejected the interpreters, and Islam has too no way to respond to any of these things, so they reject all of modernity and say that everything that is modern is evil and wrong and vile. And that's because these religions are religions of the book. They have a sacred text, and there's no way to move beyond that text. But Christianity is not a religion of the book. Our Bible didn't appear on the scene until 350 A.D. It's unlikely that there was more than five or ten people at any one time in Jewish history who could read the entirety of the Old Testament. Because you're talking about a book that's written in a multitude of different languages. And so we can figure out a lot about the world. We can understand and, have and experience a lot in this world before we ever go to the Bible. And the Holy Spirit can speak to us in an incredibly powerful way before we ever pick up the Bible. And in fact, the Lord does use a great deal of our experience and the, and the world and history and saints and lives and human nature to speak to us beyond the words that are written in what we call the Bible. Now, God did this. He revealed himself in history and to the people who wrote the Bible. 
And so it's not as if this text was simply kind of passed down from on high. It genuinely came from human beings. And that's a beautiful thing. God revealed himself in Abraham uh, as father. Then he revealed himself to Moses as ruler. Finally, he reveals himself to us in Jesus Christ as a savior, a brother, a master, a priest, a prophet, a king. Everything God communicates about himself, now everything is valuable. But the important thing we have to remember here is what John tells us at the beginning of his gospel. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word. We get that in Greek. Greek is the language that John's gospel is written in. And so the word we get is logos which means the wisdom, the, the communication, the thought, the word, all tied together. It's all this whole idea of the entire mind of God. You know, this is an incredibly deep idea. And, and John tells us that the word became flesh. He dwelt among us, and he tells us that because of that, we have beheld his glory. Now we have to say, how do we know that glory? Well, we know that glory because he remained with us in the third person of the Holy Trinity. I never met Jesus Christ in person. I just never had that privilege. Also, he you know, died and rose from the dead and returned to heaven an awful long time before I ever drew my first breath. And yet at the same time, the Lord reveals himself to me personally through the Holy Spirit who dwells among us even now. And when we pray, especially when we attend Mass, when we, have, when we attend sacred liturgies, we're drawn near to the Lord who makes us even, who makes, uh, you know, who make even the densest of us, give access, who gives even the, the weakest willed of us, the weakest minded of us, access to the wisdom and knowledge of God, right? That's what we call, talk about at confirmation when we receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, three of the seven, you know, that are tied to this idea of logos, the wisdom, the mind of God. We also have to remember that wisdom and intellect is not the whole story because you have plenty of great saints, one, who never were educated, but two, who praise the holiness, not of themselves, but of their grandmothers. You know, I know most of the holiest people I know are not, you know, people who are out teaching in cathedrals. They're little old ladies who came to me for confession, and I left that confessional humbled by the holiness and piety. And I'm like, I'm never going to be as holy as that little old lady is ever, ever in my life. And so it's not a function of intellect or wisdom that the Lord wants to, to use in order for us to connect with him. So what we don't want to do is get into our heads the idea that simply by accessing a book or by thinking about a book, we can access the heart and mind of God. Now that said, that does not mean that the Lord does not need the Bible or that the Bible is not important or that it's not useful. God reveals himself to us in three interconnected ways. First, he reveals himself through the sacred tradition that Jesus spoke audibly to his disciples and that he spoke audibly to the saints through their, their prayer. I shouldn't say spoke audibly to the saints. He spoke audibly to the disciples. He spoke interiorly to the saints. Some of them he spoke audibly to. I'm thinking of, you know, Joan of Arc or Faustina Kowalska, whatever. But, but the, the Lord reveals himself through the communication he has with individuals. That is what we call sacred tradition. He also reveals himself through that part of the sacred tradition, which was written on paper, which was actually written down. That is what we call the scripture. Now, there's an interesting story about where that comes from. I'll tease into that a little bit. But we have sacred tradition. We have sacred scripture. And then the Lord reveals himself through the official, infallible teachings of the church, which give us the correct and certain understanding of the scriptures, which can only come from the official teaching of the church. Now, this is an area that some folks are wildly misunderstanding nowadays. You go out there and people say, well, you know, the Pope said it, so it must be sacred tradition, or, or this bishop taught that, and therefore, 
we're not talking here about what every priest's sermon has ever said. When we talk about the magisterial teaching of the church, we're talking about a relatively small body of teaching that comes from councils, official teachings of popes, and a handful of other small sources like canon law and things like that. So this is not the teaching of the church in the sense that the catechism of the Catholic Church is, for example, a magisterial document. There's a, a much, much more uh, deep and profound understanding than we're looking for here. And we can't simply say, ah, you see, I've got a copy of the Catechism. I have the teaching office of the church. That's not the way this stuff works. So let's kind of work our way through some of these uh, just to get a better sense of what I'm talking about, because I don't want to get us too off, off topic. But at the same time, I don't want us to misunderstand the role that the revelation God gives us plays in understanding the value of Bible study. And so we'll start with sacred tradition because that's, that's a big part of it. Now, many, many of our Protestant brothers and sisters, some of our convert brothers and sisters, are trepidatious of the notion of traditions because the idea is that traditions, with a little t, come from men. After all, traditions are just customs. You know, they're, they're vague and they have no meaningful authority. They can be skewed or misunderstood. In my house, we always fried turkeys. And so there's the tradition where when the turkey finally comes out of the fryer, Thanksgiving can really begin and get started. Well, that's great, but that's a largely meaningless tradition. It doesn't have some kind of broader sense. It's just something my family invented and it starts and stops at my family. We're not talking here about traditions or customs when we speak about the sacred tradition. This is tradition with a capital T. We're talking about the fact that Jesus gave his disciples the authority to teach and to act in his name. Remember that Jesus specifically told them to go out to all the world and to tell the good news. He told Peter, here are the keys of the kingdom. What you held bound will be held bound. What you loose will be held loose. And so there is an authority that is given specifically to the apostles to teach. And their teaching, which comes to us from prayers that they wrote, the authority that which, which they taught, assured by Jesus when he said that the gates of hell will not prevail. This includes dogmatic and moral teaching. It includes prayers, rituals, spiritual teachings, as well as laws that were established. So when we talk about the sacred tradition, we're really talking about the whole shebang. Everything that the apostles produced, everything that they taught when they really taught, now we have to remember, St. Peter at the Council of Jerusalem, when he was, uh, and this is told in the, in the book of Acts, had to say, hang on a minute, this is my opinion, but we all got together, we talked about it, and we've decided this opinion changed slightly. Remember, Peter said you had to be cir circumcised to be a Christian, and after the apostles met and talked about it, they corrected. So we, we have to think about tradition as a broader uh, uh, context, the entirety of tradition. There were popes who taught errors, and then a council would come together, and everybody would think about it, and they would say, you know what, uh, you know, the pope has been preaching X, turns out there's a better way to say that, and when we talk about Jesus having a, a human nature and a divine nature, that's a better way of saying it than saying that Jesus is a human person and a divine person. He's one person, but he has two natures. And you can see how that's confusing. And so when we think about tradition, we want to make sure that we have a relatively tight notion of what that tradition means. This is the prayers, the rituals, the laws, the official teaching, hammered down of what the church believes and has taught all the way through history. Question marks, things that are up for discussion, things that we are not sure about, you know, those things don't belong in the body of sacred tradition right now. So too, things that are limited to a very specific point in history, like whether or not the first crusade was just or unjust, that probably doesn't necessarily belong within this notion of tradition. Now, I'm not trying to teach a, a course on this um, because it can, be, it can become very, very confusing. You may already feel your head spinning. So we're going to move forward um, it, by, by saying there is a slight difference between sacred tradition, broadly speaking, and the official teaching office of the church. The teaching office codifies 
the sacred tradition. So we have the broader sacred tradition, and then we have the teaching office of the church, which hammers down whether or not the first crusade was just or unjust. And so sacred tradition, the broader topics, the magisterium of the church, making the specific decisions and hammering those down to specific pronouncements. So we have a broader and a narrower context, and then we're in a position to start talking about where the scriptures fit in. Because there are, were, in fact, a lot of scriptures, some of which we call the canonical scriptures, and some of which we don't, because we have those scriptures that were chosen specifically to be included in uh, the Bible, and then we have other scriptures, which may or may not be good. One of the most famous is the Didache, which is a book called The Teaching of the Apostles, and yet it's not included in the Bible, and, and there are a number of reasons for why that is. We also have to, to recognize and understand uh, up front that the, the study of Scripture, the study of theology, the study of magisteria, the study of sacred tradition, all of these things are both an art and a science. And in particular, with the study of Scripture, we're talking about an art and a science. It's an art in that it has to be done in the context of belief. It has to be done in the context of love. There is a phrase that theology must begin on our knees. And that's the same, it's a reality with Scripture. If we come to Scripture like an atheist, and we read it like, like I might read Shakespeare, there's a lot of value there. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be something that I'm going to get anything meaningful out of. And so if we're going to study the Scripture together, we have to start that study of Scripture by believing, by loving, by having a deep sense that this is not a mechanical scientific process. There's a genuine art to it. Also, we have to understand that Scripture is alive and dynamic and that it speaks to us on a number of levels. When I go to Mass, for example, the words, the actions, all have their particular part to play. And so do the lesser important but still valuable parts. This is the architecture, the vestments, the, the beautiful things, the music, the, the incense, the sermon, the solemnity, the candles, the windows, the furniture. All of those things have their part to play, and that's true with Scripture as well. And that's where the art starts to give way to the science and how they both have to play their parts. Remember, various books of the Bible are written in Hebrew, Aramaic, Uritic, Greek, Latin, and some other little subtle nuancey sort of things like Persian. And so it includes you know, this, this complicated series of languages which themselves evolved over time. The Bible itself goes from about 2000 BC when the first book would have been written um, and maybe even a little earlier depending on when Job was actually written down. And then it goes all the way to about 100 or so AD. And along the way, Greek is going to change. And the way that Greek is spoken in, you know, in, in this part of the world is very different than the way that Greek was spoken you know, a thousand years ago in a different part of the world. And the same thing is true with the, the Aramaic. The same thing is through, true of the Hebrew. And the, and the fact that there's all these subtle nuances means that it's very difficult for me to pick up a translation and to say I can pick up all the details. Uh, it's also one of these things where we have to realize there's the Jewish, there's the Roman, there's the Greek, there's the Egyptian, there's the Babylonian cultures, and they were peopled by all sorts of interesting characters who show up in our Bible who have all sorts of motivations that are very difficult to suss out. Why did Nebuchadnezzar come in and do what he did? Why did he hate uh, the three young men so much? Why, um, why did, did, did Elijah do what he did? And why did the strange people around Elijah do their thing? What was the deal with the pharaohs? You know, there's a lot of moving pieces that make it difficult for us to say, I can pick up all the nuance or all the details. And we have to remember, too, there's just plenty of moral and immoral people who show up along the way. And so we don't want to read, you know, the fact that Abraham had a number of different wives and say, aha, therefore it's okay for me to have a number of different wives. It's also, you know, kind of important for us not to hold ourselves to, to too high a standard because none of us are going to be able just to go in and pick up, even if we spoke these languages, pick up the Bible and just get it. Now, fortunately, with a bit of understanding of this kind of scientific part, we can learn 
to do some of the art part without necessarily having to turn to a big, complicated, overly intellectual study. What I'm going to do in the next three talks is not a big, over-the-top intellectual study. We're going to look at basically four kind of pieces of how this works, because there are four basic ways that we as Catholics interpret Scripture. And so let's I want to I talk a little bit about those, but I want to read a little, a little passage of Scripture from Matthew's Gospel so that we have something to work with as I explain the four senses, as we call them, of Scripture. And so uh, this is taken from Matthew chapter 14. This is 25 through 33. And so in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately he spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Have no fear. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. And so Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. So there are four ways that we as Catholics would look at this from a little bit of the science and kind of say, now that I've got a little bit of the science, I can start to get into the art of Scripture study. So keeping in mind the story of that, the first thing that we would do if we were going to study the Bible in a kind of a pseudoscientific sense would be to say, what does the story say? What is the literal sense of this passage? What's going on? What's actually happening? Um, what does the story say happened? What's the plot? Who are the characters? Uh, what is the actual message? You know, we have the sense that Jesus can walk on water. We have the sense that if he wants to, he can give other people the power to uh, kind of defy nature, so to speak. Uh, we have all sorts of kind of literal things happening here. And so the first thing we want to do is get a sense of what is that? Now, in the book of Revelation, chapter 9, when we're talking about hornets with blonde hair, this is going to become a little bit more challenging because it's clear that we're not actually expecting at the end of days to have a flock of tiny little hornets with silly blonde hair. But what is the literal thing? What does it say? What's, what's the story say? In this case, there's a boat. The disciples are in it. Jesus comes. Peter sinks. Everyone gets saved. Yay, God. So we have a basic sense of the story. Now, of course, we can go a lot deeper. We can go into some very, que very specific questions about what does a boat symbolize? What does water symbolize? Why does the fourth watch of the night matter? What does it mean when the Jews say a ghost? How fearful are they of ghosts? What does the church actually teach about ghosts? We can go deeper and deeper and deeper when it comes to this kind of sense. But, but that's one of the first things we have to look at is what, what do we understand you know, how does this work? So once we have a kind of a literal sense, then we start to say, okay, let's look at some of the spiritual senses. And so we look into what's called an analogical sense or an analogy of faith sort of sense. And so basically we say, you know, is this passage symbolic of something? Is it an, an analogy in some way, shape, or form? Does it represent, or do parts of it represent larger images of the faith or the spiritual life or some historical event? You know, in this case, we have a raging storm. Well, that can symbolize chaos in our lives. It can symbolize the craziness of the world. When Peter stops looking at Jesus, that certainly symbolizes, you know, losing focus and, and paying attention too much to the craziness. It symbolizes sin. It symbolizes even grave sin. Um, you know, the, the fact that, that he cries out is symbolizing that only Jesus can save him. You know, these are, these are you know, easy enough to see. Um, there can be hundreds of ways of thinking about this analogical sense, but basically, once we've got a sense of what the story says, then I want to flip my Bible open and say, okay, now I've got a sense of what the story says. Now let me look and see if there are any obvious aspects of it that symbolize 
something else. Now, I, as a preacher, use this constantly because, you know, I, I read through the basic story and I, generally speaking, I, I, I grab three or four kind of things and say these can stand as, as clear symbols of something in the spiritual life. And that's something that every single one of us can do. And in fact, it's going to change for us the more we read. This passage with the walking on water is easy because there's a lot of them. You know, the, in, in, the, in the middle of the night, you know, you say, well, gosh, in the middle of a dark night where I'm having a difficult time or, or you know, it's, it seems like I, I'm, I've, when I've lost touch with God, this is where I find myself. When you have the idea of a ghost, when you have the idea of the waves, there's so many easy things we can see. And at some times in my life where I'm perhaps lower, I might focus more on those harder things. At other times in my life where I'm perhaps a bit higher, I might look more at other parts of it, like the fact that we're all gathered together in the boat, and despite all the waves, the boat is still you know, afloat. The boat is still there. Or that Jesus is always coming to save us. He's always just right there if we're willing to reach out to him. And so there's a lot of different ways that we can do that, but we start with the literal, and then we move to the analogy of faith, the analogical. From there, we go to the moral sense, the moral sense. And that's easy enough, and it doesn't always exist, but we're looking, are there lessons for how to live my life here? Are there lessons for how to choose that which is right and that which is wrong? And in today's, you know, in that gospel, it's relatively straightforward. You know, I should keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. I should focus on Him. I should not let myself be overtaken by the chaos and busyness of the world. The Lord should come first and everything else should come second easy enough. And that will extend beyond that to other moral decisions where we might, you know, have to say, gosh, what should I do in this situation? Should I prioritize God or should I prioritize mammon? Or should I give to, to God what is God's and Caesar to what is Caesar's? And again, that's not something that we necessarily need to make as the only thing that we're reading, but it's a part of it. Also, we have to be careful because then when we get to this sort of case, Every bad internet argument where someone quotes the Bible is somebody thinking that they understand the moral sense of every scripture. Some doofus on the internet the other day uh, quoted me some completely out of context mess from Ezekiel, thinking that therefore, because Ezekiel said this random thing, you know, 700 years before Jesus showed up on the scene, therefore the church was supposed to do this in the context of that. And you go, that's just stupid. That's not what the Bible is meant to be. It's not just a bunch of random proof quotes. And of course, that's a big problem when we get into arguments with people is everybody wants to reach for their book of pull quotes and say, this proves this and that proves that. The moral sense of Scripture is not meant to be at the top of the list of important things. We might draw some wisdom from it for ourselves, but ultimately the church needs to be the teacher of morality, and I shouldn't be drawing morals out of the Scripture that allow me to do something um, which the church says I should not do, or that to, to prevent myself from doing something the church says I should do. There are plenty of random verses in the Bible that I can use to justify my bad behavior. I get into an argument with someone, and I, and I can pull out my quote and say, Ah, Jesus did not bring, to come to bring peace. He came to bring discord. So, uh, that's not the way we're meant to read. So we start with the literal. We move to the analogy of faith. We touch base with the moral, and then we find ourselves in the anagogical. And there's not really an English word uh, to play with anagogical, but here we're looking for two moving pieces. One, if it's the Old Testament, we're looking for how this verse of the Old Testament points to Jesus. And so if we're thinking about the, the image of the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you are to name him Emmanuel, well, that's easy enough. If we turn to Isaiah and we see the suffering servant, easy enough. If we, if we look to the third chapter of Genesis and we see that the offspring of the woman will strike at the head of the serpent, easy enough. In some places it's much, much more difficult, but that's what we're thinking of. And this is a, a more theological approach, 
but we're saying, you know, is Jesus visible in the Old Testament? If we're in the New Testament, then we're looking to the end, the eschaton, the end of the world, the, the conclusion of days, not necessarily in an apocalyptic sense, but just in the sense of what does the end look like? What does this point to? Does this verse in some way show us the end of days? And, you know, and, and in our verse today, where our passage today where Jesus walks on the water, um, you know, we can, we can enter, um, or I should say, we can only really enter into that when we're called to enter into it, right? So the end of the world comes, well, Jesus has to come. He has to be the one we have to focus on, and we can only take a step out of this world, symbolized by the boat, when he calls us. And if I try to do it myself on my own will or my own power, I will sink and I will be destroyed. And so, you know, the end of my life, you know, this, this could actually reference some things about suicide. It could reference some things about the moral life more broadly speaking, especially it involves the end of the world. That's not what this is, that's not what this verse is meant to be about exclusively. It's not the main reason that the Lord brought this event about, but it's yet another layer of meaning. And in addition to these four, we could add others. You know, there's certainly the literal sense, there's certainly the analogy of faith, there's certainly the moral sense, and there's certainly this sense pointing to Jesus in the Old Testament, pointing to the end of days in the New Testament, but we might also read it in saying, in a sense of a broader context, and say, does this have to do with other verses in other parts of the Bible that have some very specific connection to this, and how do those all play together as a team? We could look at this in light of the way it's been interpreted by modern day saints or by saints between now and then. I know oftentimes when I read a verse, I'll look to what St. Augustine or St. Thomas Aquinas had to say and, and try to say, I really want to interpret this the way that they did. The fathers of the church, people like Justin Martyr, St. Basil, St. Gregory of Nazianzen, looked at these sorts of things and really tried to grab every little nuance down to the idea of, if it's the fourth watch, what does that mean if it would have been the third watch or the second? Or if you know, Jesus sat down and there were nine people here or 13 people here, what does that number symbolize? And so there's a great number of things we could really dig into. But for you and me, ordinary people trying to study the Bible, the most important thing is that we begin on our knees, that we begin with prayer and we say, Lord, what do you want to say to me? It is not all that important that every single one of us understand every complicated detail of what this verse may or may not mean in the larger scope of the universe. When we study the Bible, we do want to have some sense of the literal. We do want to grab some sense of the analogy of faith. There might be a moral lesson specific to me. There might even be some theological aspect that I, I pick up on if I've got some training in that direction. But end of the day, we study the Bible because we want the Holy Spirit to speak to us through this study, through the lens of our own minds and our own hearts. And so as we pick up next time, with the, we're going to start on the book of Revelation, and we'll start on what the angel said to all these different churches, I really want us to think hard about not so much what all these things mean into everybody in the universe, but how do these little bits of fact, how do these little bits of information and context open my heart to hear what the Lord wants to say to me through my study of Scripture? And y'all, that's the most important thing. And why is that the most important thing? Because the book is not the message. We are not a religion of the book. We are not people who came to take a sacred text from God and use that to figure it out. The Bible is not basic instruction before leaving earth. The Bible is not the message. Why? The Lord became flesh and dwelt among us. He, he, not it, he is what we're here for. He is how we will get to heaven or not. This book will help us to know Him. This book will not help us to go to heaven. It will not. It will either get us closer to Jesus Christ or it won't. 
But it's not going to be we're going to go up, show up at St. Peter and go, look, I've got a Bible with me. Doesn't that mean super good? I've memorized the whole freaking thing. And he goes, well, good for you. Could have memorized Shakespeare just as well. The Bible is not, is not our salvation. It is one way in which God has revealed himself and through which we can gain nearness to him. Remember that for the first 1,600 years or so, there were, no, there were very, very few printed Bibles. I mean, almost none. And that the vast majority of people who lived and died as good, holy Christians, and in fact, an awful lot of the people who lived and died as saints of the church, never, ever, ever picked up a Bible. They heard preaching. They may, depending on where they lived, have had the, the priest read the scripture for them in their native language? Maybe not. And so we don't want to get our heads stuck in the idea that the Bible is our sacred text. It is a sacred text, but our Bibles are there to get us nearer to the Lord who became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what Bible study is for. It is not about deepening our knowledge of the, of the book. It is about deepening our knowledge of the Lord. And that's what we're going to endeavor to do the next three talks. So I hope you'll join me again for Revelation Part 2, where we actually have Revelation Part 1. And this will then be our, our prequel of sorts on why we study the Bible. Thank you for joining me. Of course, if you always have any questions, please connect with me on social media. You can hit me at CatholicUnderground.tv. You can hit me on, social me on uh, Facebook, on Twitter, wherever you want to. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you again for Part 2.